Thank you, Ron. Pleased to have with us the longest serving Calgary Flame and newly minted captain. Actually, not so new. It was the end of September, but new to us because it's our first visit of the year to Calgary. Here's Michael Backlund. Look, uh, close, tough loss tonight, but even with it, it's been quite a turnaround for the Flames. Uh, earlier in the week, you were briefly back in a playoff spot. Greg. What was it, Michael? I know you don't like, nobody likes to talk about what happened behind closed doors, but uh, the team was struggling. They're adapting to a new coach. As a captain, uh, how did you address that? Well, I think, um, you know, we all just stepped up our game a little bit and felt like um, we uh, were kind of out of sync a little bit early on. And, uh, you know, bringing those young guys up brought some energy to our team and it also uh, solidified some lines for us and deep pairings. And I think that helped our team to play better. Um, so I think it was everyone stepped in in different ways and Husky and his team has done a great job pushing us the right way too. Michael, uh, you, of course, know Elliot Friedman. Yes, right. I do know. <laughs> uh, hockey's number one journalist, not afraid to ask the tough questions. And so tonight, Elliot would like to know. Questions coming here. Do we have it? <laughs> That's his best work. No, wait, I, I, That's I, his oh, best work, is. actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ask him how he parts his hair so beautifully. Elliot would kill for that clean line. Yeah, my barber here in Calgary do a great, great job cutting my right. hair, and then I just uh, take my time brushing him. All right, well, look, with this picture, I would suggest that Elliot has more to worry about than the part <laughs> in his hair. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not his <laughs> best look, maybe. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> to be fair, that was uh, just around the time of the end of the pandemic, and I think Elliot sent that out as proof of life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get back to the revival. Much of it can be traced to what I would say probably was your first major test as captain, and that was to quiet the noise that resulted from uh, public discussion about contract negotiations and trade demand. A lot of noise early in the season. How did you bring quiet and focus? Well, we talked about it even before that, um, you know, not to uh, stir things up in media and keep everything within the walls. And uh, I think that's an important thing to keep everything inside the locker room and be a tight group. And, um, you know, uh, have, our, have each other's backs. And um, I think uh, that was a big key. And then, you know, when there were some trade talks over uh, there, uh, me and Haas discussed uh, how we should approach it. And, uh, um, you know, we decided he was going to uh, talk about it there in Montreal. And uh, that's what he did. And I think uh, that was good to sort things out. And uh, from then, we've been playing better. General Manager Craig Conroy has gone on the record as saying that you are not afraid to have tough discussions with your teammates. So as team captain, what is your approach when you see a player that you know has more to give? Well, it, it, can, it can go different ways. Um, you know, sometimes a player needs a little talk and a little help. Uh, you know, to boost him up a bit, or sometimes he needs to hear it, you know, and I try to find that balance and try to read uh, read uh, each individual and what they need. And uh, same thing in the, in the you know, in the big group, uh, in the room when everyone's there, you know, we got to keep everyone kind of accountable and uh, live up to our standards that we have here, uh, the way we want to play. And uh, I think that's a big key for success. We all have mentors and along the way up, uh, is there a name or two that's helped you I get prepared for being a captain of a hockey club in the National Hockey League. Well, I got to grow up here in Calgary playing with Jerome. Uh, he was a great leader, and same with Robin Regeer. Uh, the two of them were really good leaders in different ways, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed playing with both of them. Uh, and then I, you know, I got to uh, spend a lot of time uh, under Gio as, as our captain, and same thing there. Just a great teammate and leader, and. Uh, all three of those guys led the right way by playing really hard and competing. And, you know, when, the, when they had to say something in the locker room, they did. And uh, they stepped up in different ways. And that's what I liked about them. Hey, that video suggests that you and Jerome again uh, clicked a few times uh, during your time as teammates. <laughs> uh, let's get to that day in late September. Press conference here at the Saddle Dome. Craig Conroy uh, started by announcing your two-year extension. And then for good measure, he threw in the fact that you had just been named captain of the Calgary Flames. Uh, your wife, Frida, Oliver, and Tilly were there to make the announcement even more special. You know, a lot of people felt, uh, Michael, that you were the de facto captain of the Flames since Mark Giordano was lost in the expansion draft. So has anything changed for you? Um, a little bit at first, uh, just a lot of thoughts and uh, trying to sort out what it's like to be the captain. But, you know, I had some good talk to people around me, support people and told me to just be myself. And 
and with a couple of teammates too that I've been playing with that I'm close with, you know, they told me just, you know, you've been the captain pretty much for two last two years. Mm -hmm. Just do the same thing, don't do anything extra. And uh, you know, it's always good to hear that feedback from some teammates and um so after a few games I kinda felt more comfortable with it and solidified my game a little bit more and um so yeah. Uh but it was I felt a little different wearing the sea. Um even though you know I could feel the last couple of years. Um uh, I wanted to take a bigger step, per, uh, guys leaving um, for different reasons, and um, uh, you know I felt like I had to take on some more le leadership role. And uh, uh, but yeah, when you get that C in the chest, it feels so different. With the Zadorov trade, three of your teammates are pending free agents. You'd have been the fourth flame to be playing out uh, his contract had you not taken the two-year extension, Greg. How is it in that regard, in terms of a your feeling now that you got it over with? And with your teammates, that always unknown, that it's very difficult. I played my option out as well. It's not an easy thing to do. How have you been able to deal with your teammates and how have they done with it so far? It seems like they're getting a little more comfortable with the situation. Yeah, I think that was a factor early on. There was just a lot of noise, like we talked about earlier. And I right. think that's settled a little bit now. And, um, you know, I really enjoy playing with Z. And, you know, when you come out, like, you know, requesting a trade, though, it makes a little too much noise. And to that to be settled too helps the team. And, uh, and uh, you know now we can just play hockey. I know there's still three guys who you face. <laughs> He's right behind really? us there with his black Stetson on. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> well, look at that. It's, it's all so good too. Hiding. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. I just said I really like you, so don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah but I mean, it's part boys. of the business. It's part of the business, and he knows it too. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, we had a good talk to me and him and uh, after the trade request, so it's all good. Um, but, yeah, there's still three guys that are very important for our team, and, uh, you know, things will play out the, will, uh, the way they will, and um, uh, we'll see what happens, uh, if they're going to stay or not. And uh, But until then, uh, you know, they're a part of the team, and we're just going to go to war together. Totally. You're at uh, 932 games played as of tonight, so you're set up to become uh, just the second player ever to play a thousand games as a Calgary Flame. The other one, of course, Jerome Aginla. What would it mean to you to join his company? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, that'd be, um, yeah, very, very special. Um, that was uh, also one of the reasons, you know, I decided to stay here to play 1,000 games potentially. Um, for one team uh it's special and that you know not a lot of guys have done uh i mean a lot of guys have done it but it, oh, the big picture there's the percentage is pretty small so that would be very very special and i'll be very honored to you know be right behind jerome here's a before and after picture on the right uh is michael backland the current captain of the calgary flames and uh, the before on the left is from 18 years ago and you can explain where it's from yeah from <clears throat> max to play tournament uh, we just won the, uh, the gold medal, right? Max oh, the, tournament. We were champions, yeah. yeah. But I guess we have medals on, yeah. 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 And and, yeah. Uh, and and you led Sweden to uh, to the uh, tournament championship. Who would have known back then that uh, you'd become the longest-serving Calgary Flame and team captain? Yeah, I, I never thought of it then. I thought it was just really cool to get to come over here in North America and to play. First trip, right? It was the first trip yeah. over. Yeah, it was it was awesome and really enjoyed my time here in Calgary and. Uh, what a great experience to stay with some billets too and get to um, learn some more English and lifestyle over here and everything was just uh, it was just a great it was a great tournament but I yeah I never expected myself to be where I am today. So that does take us back to how your career with the Calgary Flames started and it wasn't exactly a fast start. What do you remember about what then coach Brent Sutter said to you after the 2011-12 season, or was it Jay Feaster? It's one or the other, right? Yeah, I had a end of the year meeting with uh, Brent, like you normally do have uh, end of the year meeting with a coach. Uh, and, you know, it was a tough meeting. Uh, it was a pretty long meeting and tough. And uh, he was just straight up honest with me what it takes to be an NHL player, a regular player in this league, and what I need to learn. And it wasn't easy. Uh, it was it was hard, but you know, I took that I think the right way. And uh, later that summer, we did some contract negotiations with. Uh, with Jay Feaster, mm -hmm. and uh, once the deal was done, he called me and said, "You know, this is kind of make or break it for you, or not kind of. This is make or break it for you next season." And um, yeah, and uh, you know, it, it was uh, it was true, and uh, that's what I needed to hear, and um, I just grabbed onto it. All right, let's talk about your social conscience, which is getting a lot of exercise here in Calgary, and was appropriately recognized at uh, last summer's NHL awards. Team Clancy Award goes to. 
Michael Backlund. We as professional athletes live a privileged life and uh, we have a great opportunity to give back. A little, a little gesture from us can be a big thing in someone else's world. So the King Clancy Award goes to the player who uh, best leads on and off the ice. And uh, I loved your quote, little gesture from us can uh, be a big thing in someone else's world. It's easy to say, but you act on it. Why? Uh, it's always a hard question to answer. Uh, I just always had a drive to do it. And um, it started when I was young. And then, you know, I came here to Calgary and I could tell right away the owners and the organization right away, you know, how important uh, charity work and community work to be part of the community here in Calgary is. And uh, I could tell right away when I stepped in the locker room, all the, pretty much all the players were involved. And especially the leaders of the team had their own charities and were very involved in the community. So they set the tone and the standards for me. All right, so to your most recent charitable endeavor, tell us about the black tie dinner that you and your wife Frida hosted here in Calgary on Tuesday night. Yeah, it was great. Um, you know, we really appreciate uh, all my t our teammates for being there and the better halves. Um, a lot of the management and Huska was there, so we had a, a very special night. It was an emotional night, but it was it was a lot of fun uh, and a really good time. And we couldn't believe we raised that much money. We were hoping maybe. Wow. $100,000, uh, because last time in 2017 we raised 80000 so we're hoping to beat that, and to beat it with 100000 that was uh, pretty crazy. We yeah, $180,000 raised for ALS research. Uh, the cause is near and dear to both yours and Frida's hearts, because Frida lost her mother to ALS, um, her mother Anne, and um, of course, it is a major cause here in Calgary as the Flames assistant GM Chris Snow fought the disease for four years before he passed away at the end of September. I can only imagine how uh, you and Frida felt watching Chris's battle, uh, and in fact, the battle of his family. Uh, there they are, Kelsa, uh, Kelsey, Cohen, and Willa. Yeah, no, we, you know, it wasn't a part of uh, Frida's life when her mom passed, but she's told me, some, you know, a lot of her experiences and how tough it was. And to see Snow and his family going through it, uh, it was it, it was really hard, but also, you know, encouraging to see how strong they were through the whole time and how much money they raised and, you know, how they were not going to go away. Just, you know, Chris was going to fight it till the end, and which he did. And, you know, I'm amazed the way he fought the disease and, uh, um, you know, very sad that he passed away this fall. Um, it was a really heartbreaking funeral, but um, yeah, um, it was really sad to see what him, his family had to go through and him, of course, too. Uh, Steve Lorenz asks, what kind of impact did Chris Snow have on you as a person? Well, that smile was uh, just a great smile, and he was uh, such a great human. Um, you know, over the years, he got a bigger and bigger role, and uh, he, uh, you know, he at the end when he was sick, we, you know, we would text a little bit. And um, I remember uh, during the COVID there too, he would, you know, they would send out some stuff that we can work on. And I would just talk a little bit with, on text with Chris, uh, what my, I can improve on in my game and, uh, you know, how I can find it on the video and stuff. So, um, but, you know, that smile is something we'll always remember. And the fight he uh, took towards the LS is something you'll always remember too. So it's just a great human being that fought all the way till the end. And then Special Olympics, you're a longtime ambassador for that cause, and you have more than a passing interest in Special Olympics. What is the connection? Yeah, um, my uh, my cousin back home in Sweden, uh, me, her, uh, she has Down syndrome, and uh, um, she's such an amazing uh, uh, girl. And uh, you know, I, I enjoy every time I get to see her. I got to see her this summer, uh, which was great. I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. I think it was a year or so. So. It was great to catch up with her this summer, and uh, um, yeah, um, I always enjoy seeing her. And it's always great to come out of Special Olympics uh, events and uh, practices. Uh, those are the uh, days or nights you get the most hugs in your life. You know, it's, it's just so amazing how excited they are and how loving they are. And then uh, the Kids Cancer Care Foundation, you're also a champion of that cause. So obviously, Michael, something has helped shape your life as a, as a compassionate, caring soul. And so I will ask you about uh, the loss of your best friend, Victor Engstrom, um, to cancer at age 25 and how that changed you. Yeah, uh, it was it was very tough to see him battle. He battled so hard. Um, he was an international bandy player for Sweden. Yeah, he was yeah. very good, and he, I mean, he played all, uh, 
you know, he passed away July 1st, 2013, and he played that season before, even though he was going through chemo. And uh, you can see in the picture that he's looks a little skinny. Uh, he's always skinny, but you can tell there. Um, but yeah, he was a warrior playing through battling cancer, and he was he never gave up. And he just uh, he was just uh, such a good person. And uh, he thought, you know, from him, I, after he passed, I just learned to enjoy life a little more. Um, like he had such a good balance about being serious about his sport, but also enjoyed life. And that's something I uh, took away from, from him and something I was pushing myself to be a little more relaxed in life and enjoy a little bit more. Sometimes out of tragedy, something beautiful can happen. And that would be you and Frida. Explain. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, growing up, uh, our families knew each other. Fria's mom was really close to um, uh, Victor's mom, and my mom was also close to Fria's mom. So we had that connection, and um, me and Victor's family were close. So we, uh, going, going back, growing up, I met Frida a few times in my life, uh, but she was always so much younger than me. And, uh, you know, at Victor's funeral, um, she was there, of course, to support. and. Uh, it's a tough loss for her and her family as well, and uh, and uh, you know I saw her there, and then um, a few a couple of months later, um, Frida and uh, my sister went out for a coffee that turned into a full night dinner, and then it was an easy way for me to ask her how that night went. And oh, you had the way in then. <laughs> All right, <laughs> smart thinking. Yeah. So after that, you know, I texted her, um, yeah, and then uh, we just kept staying in touch that season and started dating once I got back to Sweden. All right, and let's fast forward now to the Backlund family. There's you and Frida, of course, and now there's also daughter Tilly and son Oliver. Have they figured out yet that their father is the captain of the Calgary Flames? Uh, Tilly has a little bit. Uh, <laughs> she, she calls me sometimes the captain, and uh, but Oliver is still trying to figure it out. He, today, actually, he he touched he, the stick and played a little bit of hockey, meaning he sticks hockey before I left. Uh, he hasn't really picked up hockey at all how about, yet. How about golf? You know, uh, maybe. You know, I tried that too. I tried soccer. He's, he's not picking it up. He just loves playing tag uh, right now. And uh, Mini sticks will be coming, believe yeah. me. Yeah. There, yeah. There's plenty of time. I know, I know. We're gonna tell, see. tell us about Frida's book, uh, Guardian Angels. It's her first book, and there's a message in it. Yeah, I know. It's... Uh, it's in a, another honor, honor to her mom, uh, in the memory of Anne. And you know, it's tough to tell kids why your grandma isn't here. Um, where is she? And uh, through this book, it's a way for Frida to to tell a little bit, you know, where Grandma Anne is. And um, yeah, she's um, always said, you know, she's always been uh, Frida's guardian angel. And um, yeah, I think the book is really good, and uh, she's really proud of it. Is there another one coming? Uh, not as a no right now. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if she wants to do another one. Alberta Christie Girl asks, uh, would you like to retire a Calgary Flame? I think we know the answer to that. And if you did, do you see you and your family calling Calgary home? Uh, we love it here. It's it's home right now. But Vestro is also our home in Sweden. And uh, uh, once I'm done over here, um, retired in the cellar, we'll move back to Sweden, uh, but we'll always come back to Calgary. Calgary is a such a spe special place for us, and you know, at that time, I'll be able to enjoy the mountains as well, do a little skiing or snowboarding. So um, that'll be a cool part of the next life. How's it going with the Swedish royal family, and uh, are you spending any time at Prince Daniel's home? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen him since uh, we won the world championships in 2018. But uh, I thought it was funny or great that he actually remembered. See me in 2011 at the on the airplane there when we randomly met each other and he sat down next to me, asked if I could switch seat because they wanted the security guy to be next to them and then he's like yeah we'll change up when we get up in the air and then you know we start talking I told him I was a hockey player he's like oh really I'll, uh, let's just sit there and talk all all flight a uh, security guy can be in the back so then we chatted most of the flight and. Uh, when I saw him again in 2018, he remembered me. I thought it was pretty cool. And we got some pictures here, I think, from the 2018 reception at the Royal Palace. And this was, as you say, after Sweden won the World Championship. Uh, so then uh, Daniel has not called and said, uh, hey, Mike, come on over. We'll have a few beers and watch the game. <laughs> no, he hasn't. Uh, <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah, I know. Uh, but maybe in the future I get to go over there again. We'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, the audit into your personal life is complete. Let's get back to hockey before we conclude here tonight and get your take on the bravery and the courage of one Chris Tanev. Greg. 
I don't know how he does it. I don't know what the guys think in the room, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it is remarkable the way yeah. he blocks shots. And uh, this the other night, I couldn't even watch it. I had to tell the truck to, that's enough. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that hurts, but. Yeah, he's such a warrior. He he doesn't even think twice about that. He just does it, and he's, uh, you know, it's been a uh, pleasure to play with him now for a few years. And I bet. Uh, he's such a warrior and uh, battles so hard every night and sticks up for for his for his team and does whatever he has to, you know, for to help the team win. You know, that was really hard to look at uh, when it occurred. A little bit easier now that we know he only has escaped with only 12 stitches to his chin and the few teeth he has left were not affected. <laughs> uh, but what's it do for the psyche of a team when you see a player sacrifice like that? Yeah, well, it brings a lot of energy on the bench. Uh, everyone just, I mean, we're a little scared, and, you know, hoping he's okay. Uh, and uh, we got the word that he was okay. But then, you know, it just brings so much energy to the group. And, uh, you know, we find a way to come back and uh, win that game. And uh, that was part of the, that block for sure. Uh, question from Josh. What does it mean to you and the guys to see Oliver Shillington back? It was great. Um, not as a team, more as a friend. Um, I got to know him over the years here. And uh, we become good friends. And it was great to see him back in the locker room here and back on the ice. And just to, I mean, I've seen him uh, outside the rink uh, a little bit um, while he's been here in Calgary a couple of times. Uh, but it was great to see him here at the rink with having so much energy and being so positive and doing so well. So it, it was great seeing him back. Yeah, I think in September he went quite public with uh, why he'd been a whale. There you go. <laughs> 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 Good Nicely done, Nikita. Thanks for dropping by. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Oliver Shillington was quite public in the fall about why he was away. He took time off to address some mental health issues. Um, what kind of respect do you have for a player when he is confident, confident enough to, to be that public about his struggle? Yeah, it shows a lot of courage. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but he had to do or did what he had to do and I think that's uh, really important um, I mean if you're not mentally healthy it's gonna be hard to play in NHL and perform in this league um, so uh, you know I really hope um, he finds a way here to come back and play and hope he finds that fire again and he wants to play so um, but yeah it takes a lot of courage to do what he did and I'm proud of him for getting help and um, yeah, like, but uh, yeah, it's great to see him again. All right. Uh, well, this has been your second appearance on After Hours. You were a guest on the program in February of 22. The uh, opposition that night with the Minnesota Wild it was a scrappy game that took over three hours to play, and I think we only had about seven minutes with you. So we were delighted to have a lot more time with you tonight. Although it might have felt to you like a three-hour interrogation. Didn't it? <laughs> it always no, does, with Scott. Uh, all good. <laughs> appreciate you guys having me here. All right, Michael. Thanks for being on the program. Yeah. Again, thanks for we having me. Yeah, There's yeah, Michael, Michael Backlund. The captain of the Calgary Flames, longest serving flame at that. Back to tidy up at Scotiabank Saddle Dome in a moment.